My name is Dr. Leah Kay, and I'm one of the reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialists at the Fertility Center of Las Vegas. If you're watching this video, perhaps it's because you're planning on uh, starting the IVF or in vitro fertilization process for fertility treatment. And so the goal of this video is to go through an orientation to that process with you. We're going to start out by talking about the IVF cycle and the stimulation protocols for the first half of IVF or creating the embryos. And we'll talk about the medications and instructions that go along with those medications. We'll also talk about pre-implantation genetic testing or PGTA, which is a test commonly used by uh, individuals and couples to evaluate their embryos. We'll also talk about preoperative and postoperative instructions prior to an egg retrieval. And then we'll talk about the frozen embryo transfer protocol, which is the second part of the IVF process, or putting the embryo back inside the uterus to make a pregnancy. We'll talk about the medications and instructions that go along with that half of the cycle. And I'll leave time on the end of this video to go through some frequently asked questions. A few disclaimers, I will use brand names of medications as well as generic names and pretty interchangeably. I'm too lazy to figure out how to do the trademark signal in this PowerPoint. And honestly, this is supposed to be used for internal use only. So uh, please discuss with us if you plan on sharing this video with anyone else. And please don't let the pharmaceutical companies know that I'm using their names probably egregiously wrong because I haven't contributed or attributed their, uh, their trademarks appropriately. Know that a lot of the medications that we're going to talk about, some are being used in a, an on-label way, some are used off-label, and in some situations there are even medications that you'll get through this process where if you're looking at the label, it will tell you do not use if you're trying to become pregnant or are already pregnant. In the vast majority of cases, we're giving you instructions to use these despite that label. So first, let's talk about the IVF stimulation cycle overview and timeline, which I've drawn out here. In general, most stimulation processes are going to start with your menstrual period, and you're going to notify your team on day one. They typically are going to schedule a baseline ultrasound and blood draw for you somewhere around cycle day three, but it can vary from day two to five. And if everything looks good on that ultrasound, they're going to give you instructions to start your stimulation medications. Usually you'll come back in for just a blood draw around four days into your stimulation medications. And then at that point, you're starting to get regularly scheduled visits every few days, every other day, and even back-to-back -back days as your follicles start to grow. Somewhere between day four to seven on average, we then will start a, a third type of medication in addition to the stimulation medications. And this medication, suppresses your ovulation. It keeps you from ovulating too soon so that as we get your follicles to grow using your stimulation meds, we can keep them growing under our control and prevent you from actually losing those eggs into the pelvis too early. So you'll get instructions about starting an additional medication to suppress ovulation. And then at this stage, you're continuing to take medications each night. And in the second week of the stimulation, when your follicles are ready, we give you instructions to take one to two trigger medications. You then are gonna come in the following day to do a blood draw, make sure that the trigger medications are working. And much of the time we're gonna do a preoperative visit with you in person and go through consent forms, check your vital signs and listen to your heart and lungs and make sure that you're ready for the next few days and what to expect as you recover. And then the day after that, or about 36 hours after your trigger, that's when your egg retrieval will be. The egg retrieval itself is an outpatient surgical procedure performed under anesthesia in the procedure room in our office. And again, I'm going to go through in a few slides instructions for what to expect on the day of retrieval. But you'll go home that same day and over the course of the next five to 10, maybe even up to 14 days, you're simply awaiting menses and that concludes the menstrual cycle. We'll go through a little bit as well of what's happening on the embryology side after your oocytes are removed. The second part of the IVF process is once you've got embryos formed, we need to put them back inside the uterus to create a pregnancy. And once again, most of these cycles are going to start with a menstrual period. However, many women are going to be entering that menstrual period either on or off of a birth control pill that you take orally 
or uh, Lupron, which is an injection that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Both of these help to suppress your own ovarian function and prevent you from creating any dominant follicles or creating any hormones on your own. And then that way, when we get started with the embryo transfer cycle medications, the only medications or hormones that are influencing your uterus are the ones that we're giving you. So typically you'll be plus or minus birth control pills, plus or minus Lupron. You're gonna get a period and you're gonna notify us when that period comes. And we're usually gonna have you come in again for a baseline around three days into your cycle. You wanna have enough time to get a thorough bleed so that most of that old endometrium has cleared out. We do an ultrasound, we do labs, and if everything is quiet on that visit, you get started on the first part of your medications, which are estradiol. You then are gonna take that for about a week and you come back in for another blood draw and ultrasound for us to see how the thickness of the endometrium is growing. And then typically from that seven day-ish visit, you'll be instructed to come back in for another visit, another ultrasound and blood draw somewhere between nine to up to 16 days or so after this initial visit and in total a number of days on estradiol. And this whole first half kind of simulates the first half of a menstrual cycle where if you've got a dominant follicle growing, your body is predominantly making estrogen. At some point in the middle of the cycle, we are gonna use the information gathered from your blood work and ultrasounds to tell you now that it's time to start progesterone. And progesterone is the pregnancy hormone or the pro-pregnancy hormone that opens the window for implantation. And it's the timing of that starting of progesterone that tells us when your embryo needs to be placed inside the uterus at almost always six days after starting progesterone. So you come in for a visit called your embryo transfer visit, and we'll go through instructions about what's happening on that particular visit and what to expect. Then typically about 10 days later, we're doing a pregnancy test with a blood draw. When you become pregnant and you get that positive result, Technically speaking, you're already four weeks pregnant, even though that embryo has only been inside your uterus for 10 days. And that's because the calculations of gestational age are based on your last menstrual period, even though for about 21 days of that last period, you haven't been pregnant. So you find out you're pregnant at about four weeks along, and then at the Fertility Center of Las Vegas, we'll continue to monitor you with blood works and your first trimester ultrasounds until you get to be about nine to 11 weeks of pregnancy. So let's back up a little bit and talk more specifically about the first half of IVF, creating the embryos. What we need to do in this protocol is recruit follicles to grow. And then once the follicles start growing, we need to suppress you from ovulating too early. Once the follicles are ready, we need to trigger ovulation. And then we need to do the process of retrieving these eggs, fertilizing them and growing them to embryos. So when it comes to that first step, recruiting the follicles to grow, it's important to understand how our ovaries work. When you come in for your diagnostic testing and we look on an ultrasound at your ovaries, we can see how many little antral follicles you have on your baseline. In any given cycle, you've got a new cohort of fresh antral follicles. These are like fruit on the tree waiting to be picked and waiting to get ripe. Some women will have three fruits hanging on that tree. Some women will have 50 fruit hanging off of that tree. And this antral follicle count is something that your doctor would have evaluated and discussed with you. At the beginning of the cycle, those antral follicles are our targets in the IVF process. And when you start using recruitment medications, you're trying to get as many of those little follicles to grow and respond to that signal as possible. In a natural menstrual cycle, for women who ovulate regularly, your brain sends out a signal that's just loud enough to recruit one of those eggs to grow. And the other eggs that were available at the beginning of that month, they'll shrivel up and die, and it's wildly depressing. So in the IVF cycle, we're trying to get all of them to grow so that we could harvest all of them and give all of them a chance to be normal, healthy eggs. Those eggs are eggs that are otherwise would have shriveled up and died. And so uh, women will often ask, does this IVF process mean that I'm running out of eggs? Am I using up all the eggs all in this cycle? And it means I'm gonna go through menopause early. And the answer is no, these are eggs that were only ever available to you this month and they were otherwise destined not to be selected. 
So we use medications to recruit your follicles to grow, and those are typically going to be the first medications that you start taking when you come in on day three. You then need to suppress early ovulation with one to two other medications that I'll show you in a moment. We trigger ovul ovulation with one to two medications that happens at a specific time when your ovaries are ready. So as we are following you for with blood work and ultrasounds, somewhere around the end of the first week of stimulation, we'll start this medication that suppresses ovulation. And now you're going to add that on to the recruitment medications that you started at the beginning of the cycle. The second half or the second week of your stimulation, you're coming in more frequently, maybe every other day, maybe back to back days. And every time you come in, we're measuring how big your follicles are growing, how many of them are there. And we're checking blood tests to look at estrogen, which should be rising as your follicles grow. We're checking progesterone, which for most part should be staying kind of low, but we're looking for early elevations in progesterone that start to tell us that your follicles are ready. We're looking at an LH level, which tells us whether or not your brain is trying to ovulate early. So we're checking all of these things every time that you come in. When your follicles are ready, which on average for most women means that most of the follicles have almost doubled in size. Way back at the beginning on your period, your antral follicles are all less than 10 millimeters each. If you fast forward to the point where you're ready for trigger, then hopefully the majority of your leading follicles are over 20 millimeters each, so they've doubled in size. When a majority of your follicles are around that size range, the high teens to 20s, you'll get instructions to take either one or two trigger medications. And these medications are gonna take at a very specific time, one time. Those start the process of ovulation. And in that process of ovulation, there's a few things happening. First of all, as your follicles grow, that egg is sort of stuck on the side of this fluid filled follicle. When you start the process of ovulation, that egg becomes free. And now it's floating free in that follicle fluid. So that when we go in and we pull that fluid out, you've got a nice uh, loose egg that comes out with it. Another thing that's happening is that your egg is getting genetically mature. And that's really the most important part of this process. Genetically mature eggs are ones that'll take up sperm and fertilize. And so the goal of this trigger is to mature your eggs and get them ready for the next step in creating an embryo. Once the eggs are retrieved, and there's a few steps I'm stepping in or skipping in here, but we're gonna come to them in more detail in a few slides. Once your eggs are retrieved, you're going to go home from your retrieval that same day with a preliminary count of how many eggs we were able to extract from you in that procedure. The number of follicles that are growing gives us an approximation of how many eggs we hope to get out, but it's almost never an exact one-to-one. -one. We hope that we get an egg out of each follicle, but some follicles will have a couple of eggs, some follicles will be empty, some follicles will have an egg that's immature, and that's an egg that we can't use. And so as you're stimulating and your, your team is counting the follicles, it only really gives us a ballpark idea of how many eggs we hope to get out at the other end. Once you go home from your retrieval, we have our first number, which is total number of eggs retrieved. The embryology lab is then going to take sperm to fertilize those eggs. And they do that by injecting a sperm one by one into each egg by hand under a microscope. That way, all the sperm need to do is show up, be moving, look normal, but they don't need to find the egg. They don't need to know the secret code to penetrate it. They just need to be there and we're gonna inject the sperm right in. The next morning, our embryology team does a fertilization check and they're gonna send in an email to you and the team to update you and how many total eggs you got, how many of them were mature, and as of the following morning, how many of them have taken up the sperm normally or fertilized. The embryology team is then going to put those fertilized eggs back into the incubator and let them grow over the course of the next up to seven days from that point. And in those seven days, you're recovering from your retrieval. You're not having to come into the office every other day. You're not having to get poked and prodded and there's a break from the needles. And so this is your chance to reset and recover. About a week out from the egg retrieval, you'll get another email update that tells you how many good quality blastocyst embryos are frozen on your behalf. Blastocyst is just a fancy name for the stage of the embryo after it's been growing in the incubator for five, six, or seven days. 
And a blastocyst started out as one single egg cell with a sperm injected into it that then doubled and then quadrupled. And before you know it, a blastocyst has a few hundred cells and it takes on a very specialized shape now where there's parts, there's an inner cell mass that's gonna be the fetus. There's an outer cell mass that's gonna be the placenta. And so it has a very characteristic shape and that has changed from one cell to about a week later, several hundred cells. At this stage, a blastocyst can be frozen very easily and kept in storage almost indefinitely as far as we can tell. Also at this stage is where our embryology team can do an optional test that we'll discuss in a moment called pre-implantation genetic testing to learn a little bit more about your embryos and help you to select the best embryo first. So in general, I gave you an overview of the basic protocol for stimulating eggs to grow and retrieving them. But there are always some modifications that can happen depending on your own egg reserve, depending on what your body wants to do, what it wants to give us, depending on age, and depending on your prognosis. So I also prepare people for the possible modifications that your doctor might instruct you on. Some modifications include taking a few um, trigger medication injections prior to actually starting your stimulation. And we'll do this very commonly to check and make sure that we know exactly what doses to use for your trigger or your triggers. There's a few medication options. There are several dosage options and everybody absorbs medications a little bit differently and everybody's body reacts a little bit differently to these triggers. But if you'll remember, you only take these trigger medications exactly one time. This is not the time to find out that in fact, we use the wrong dose or the wrong medicine. So in many cases, we start out prior to your stimulation using a, a stimulation test or a trigger test. And that involves injecting these medications one time and coming in typically the following day to do a blood draw and make sure that you've responded appropriately. Another mod modification is sometimes we will pre-treat women who are going through IVF with a medication prior to the onset of their menses when they're planning to get started. And the way that this works is it, for women, especially as we get older and our brain starts to talk louder to our eggs, some women have already started to grow a dominant egg before they show up on their period. That doesn't work so well for IVF because once you have one dominant egg, it sends out a signal to the, all the other follicles to say, you guys lost, I won, you guys don't stand a chance. And those other follicles, they shrivel up and die. So if there's something that we can do to even the playing field for all of your follicles, it includes taking medications before you're even able to recruit those first eggs. So sometimes women will start out either on a birth control pill or a medication that suppresses ovulation or on estrace pills or estrogen patches. And the goal of all of those pre-treatment medications is to quiet all of your follicles so that when you come in on your period, they all have equal access to the recruitment medications. Another modification is that I mentioned there's a couple of different trigger medications and at various doses. Some women will only get one trigger. Some women will get two triggers. And it depends on what your medication protocol was, as well as how you performed when we do our, our trigger test uh, doses. And then finally, there are some women who require medications after their retrieval to help with comfort as they recover. Typically, there are going to be women who recruit a lot of eggs in the IVF process. When you recruit a lot of eggs, your ovaries are big and swollen, and they cause you to feel a lot of discomfort and bloating. And we're going to talk about strategies when we review the pre-op and post-op instructions, strategies for getting your ovaries to shrink up as quick as possible and minimize bloating. But sometimes there are situations where those eggs are, or excuse me, those ovaries are so big that we want to keep you comfortable by giving you a few additional injections or pills as you're recovering from your retrieval. So let's talk a little bit about the medications that are available. When you come in on your period, the first thing you do is you start recruitment medications. And there's kind of two main medications that we use. Both of these medications are essentially FSH or follicle stimulating hormone. And that's a hormone that's being made by the pituitary in the brain and it's recruiting your follicles to grow. The reason it's called follicle stimulating hormone is because it stimulates the follicles to grow. So the two medications that we have are recombinant FSH. One of them is called Gonalef, looks like this. I apologize if it's on reverse for your video, but you can kind of get the point. It's white with burgundy. The other medication is called Folistim. And both of these are those really cool pens where you take the cap off of the pen. And if you look inside, 
For gonal F, there's sort of a pre-filled section where there's liquid inside it, and it's ready to go. And there's little tick marks that show you doses. For um, folistim, there's a little area where you have to insert a cartridge right in here that has the medication, a liquid medication in it. And then it has doses along here that you'll dial up. For both of these medications, typically, we ideally we'll have another video for you to follow up with that shows you how to use these medications. Most of these cartridges have several doses loaded in there. They'll come in 300 units or international units, 900 international units. So pay close attention to how much is used each time because it's, it's commonly the case that they're multi-dose vials, meaning that if you're instructed to take 300 IUs, but your cartridge has 900 IUs in it total, you should be able to get three doses or three nights worth of medication out of it, okay? So those are the two stimulation medications, Tholestim and Gonalef. There's another medicine that I should have written in on the slide called Menapure. It is another recruitment medication like Gonalef and Tholestim. Um, and unlike the handy dandy preloaded pens, it comes in a powder and a vial that you're gonna have to mix on your own. Typically you're instructed to take one whole powdered vial. So you take one CC or one milliliter of, sal of saline from the liquid vial that comes with it. You draw the whole thing up, you put it into the powder and you swirl it around. Then you draw that up and now you've got it in a syringe to give your health self the whole dose, the whole vial, which is 75 international units. It typically is coming with some kind of syringe kit like this. And if you take a look at the needle that's loaded on your syringe and it looks way too big to put in your body, then it probably is. There also now are two options for medications to prevent you from ovulating too early. Technically, actually there's three, but I'm gonna show you examples of the two we use most commonly. One of them is called Ganarelix. It comes in a blue block box that looks just like this. And inside this box is a pre-filled syringe where all you have to do is pull the rubber stopper off, put it in your body and you give yourself the whole contents of that syringe and then discard the syringe. It's one time use and it's done. The other one is called Cetratide. So Cetratide is uh, a little bit more complicated. It's a little kit that you have to kind of um, open up the pre-filled syringe and potentially add a little bit of water in it, but it also is a one-time use only. So you use the contents of this kit and then you discard it and the next night you're gonna use another one. So those are the two main medications that we will use for preventing you from ovulating too early. There's another one called Lupron and unfortunately I don't have an example of it. But when we use Lupron to prevent you from ovulating too early, this is one of the modifications that I mentioned. Usually you're going to start Lubron if that's the plan in the cycle before your period actually even starts and then you continue it. So that's kind of the exception to the rule where I mentioned that usually you're going to start these suppression medications somewhere between day four to seven of your stimulation. If you're using Lupron, you're actually going to start that one earlier in the process before your period might even start. So then there are medications to trigger ovulation. And these two medications, unfortunately, I don't have an example of either, uh, but one of them is actually Lupron, which I just mentioned, uh, where it comes in a kit and we give you instructions on how to mix it, how to draw it up and how you to give yourself a full dose. Another one is called HCG, which might sound familiar because it's actually the pregnancy hormone. HCG is something that comes in um, two, um, two vials. So it looks a little bit like this. This isn't actually HCG. This is another medication that I'll describe to you. But essentially one vial is going to have powder in it. One vial is going to have water in it. And you're going to be instructed to pull up some amount of water. It may not be the whole vial worth of water. So this is where the instructions come in and really important. You'll be instructed to pull up some amount of water, but perhaps not the whole vial. You're going to put that into the powder. And then you swirl it around to mix it until you see that all the powder has been dissolved. You then are gonna be instructed to pull up some certain amount of that liquid. And again, it may actually not be the whole amount that you just put into there. And this is where the instructions get really important because this is how we dilute this and give you a specific dose. Most of these vials come with a total amount in there, but you may or may not need to get that total amount. So sometimes you gotta follow instructions real close to make sure you're getting the right portion of that full vial of powder. Um, there's another trigger called Ovidril that comes as a pre-filled syringe, and it looks a lot like the ones I showed you here, but it's used for triggering and not for suppressing ovulation.
Then when it comes to like needle gauges, here's a little trick. The smaller the number is on the gauge, the bigger the needle it is. And so typically the bigger number is going to be the size that you're putting into your body. The lower number, like 18, 18 gauge, that's a very big needle. That's for drawing up medications and mixing them. But then you're going to switch your needle from the big, big one to something that's far more comfortable and maybe only goes under the skin and has a higher number like 27 gauge, that means it's smaller. And then it gets injected into the skin and all of this is one time use, you toss it. So those are a rundown of the medications. There's two to three medications that you may be instructed to use to recruit eggs to grow. There's one of two medications that you'll be given instructions to suppress ovulation and you'll be told when exactly to start it. And that varies from person to person. And then there are several options available for trigger medications and you'll usually be getting one or two trigger medications to take one time at a very specific time. So let's talk now a little bit about pre-implantation genetic testing or we call it PGT. There are different types of PGT, and when you're looking through the paperwork, you might be confused about which one is it that I'm talking about now. And what I'm going to talk about in general is the PGT we do most often called PGT-A, and the A stands for aneuploidy. Aneuploidy means that we're looking at the overall karyotype of every embryo or the chromosome makeup. Is it 46? Are there any extra? Are there any missing? The other kind of PGT that we do, PGT-M, the M stands for monogenic diseases. And so that will be a situation where if there's some specific single gene disorder that you know that you are um, a high risk of passing on, for example, cystic fibrosis or the BRCA breast cancer gene, there's something very specific that you in particular know you're at high risk of passing on, then PGTM is the test that's performed on your embryos to figure out which ones didn't inherit that gene from you or your partner or both. But otherwise, most people going through this process qualify to do PGTA if they desire. So PGTA allows us to select the embryo with a little bit more accuracy. Whenever you make blastocyst embryos and they get frozen, the ones that are frozen have been given a grade based on visualization. Our embryologists can look at them under the microscope and say, this one gets an A or a B or a C or a D. And it's like the report card where A is the best and B is also pretty damn good. And in general, in our lab, A's and B's are equivalent when it comes to pregnancy outcomes. C's and lower, not so great. And in our laboratory, we don't freeze anything that has a C grade or lower because we just find that they don't survive the thaw very well and they typically end up with negative pregnancy tests. And for us, we would rather know that it's gonna be negative before we go through the whole process of getting your uterus ready and getting your hopes up and putting the embryo in and avoid the loss of time and money and medications. So sufficient quality to be cryopreserved means that the visuals, the visualized grading is an A or a B. But once you know that, you can also know a little bit more about the genetic makeup of each of those embryos. And that's where PGT comes in. Let's say you have three beautiful embryos after the IVF process. You could just pick the best looking one, the one with the most A's, the one with the highest letter grade. But you also can take a sample of cells, five to 10 cells from each of those blastocysts. And you're taking the sample from the outside of the embryo. So it's the part that's gonna be the placenta. And these embryos simply reproduce and replace those cells. They don't miss these cells. And the embryos then get frozen until we can find out what the results are. The biopsies get shipped off to our genetics lab. Takes about two weeks. And then you get a report back that tells you, all right, embryo number one is normal karyotype. 46 chromosomes, no extra, no missing. Embryo number two is normal, 46, no extra, no missing. Embryo number three has an extra chromosome 21, for example. And that's also known as trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. So PGTA is able to pick up those large chromosome errors like extras or missings that might make you prone to a negative pregnancy test or to a miscarriage once the pregnancy starts to implant and grow, or in rare cases, a live birth, but a baby with major chromosomal anomalies like Down syndrome. The um, recommendation when you find out that an embryo is abnormal is to discard that embryo. We don't transfer back in embryos that have been PGT tested and are normal. But if you had that report, normal, normal, not normal, now we know that embryo number one or number two is fair game. The other thing that you can learn from that sampling is the gender of the embryos if you want to know them. 
we can't control the gender. We can't make this a boy or make this a girl. It is what it is. And frankly, it's the sperm that dictates the gender of each embryo. So if you don't get what you want, you know who to blame. Um, but you can find that out if you want to, or we keep it a surprise. You can decide if you want to choose a certain gender first, or you can have our embryology lab pick the best quality embryo to use first. Uh, and we keep all of that information for our records, but how much you guys decide you want to know is up to you. Um, for more information about PGT testing, because it's a complicated topic, I do point patients to an episode of a podcast that my partner, Dr. Bedient, um, is one of the hosts for. The name of the whole podcast is Fertility Docs Uncensored. And if you're not listening, here's a shameless plug for it because I think it's really great and informative. But in particular, episode number 57, if you're looking through the archives, is about carrier screening and about pre-implantation genetic testing. There's a ton of really great episodes. And so you may be able to find a lot of great answers there for questions that you have. So let's talk about the pre-op visit. I mentioned after you get your trigger, you're usually gonna come in the following day for a blood draw and we can make sure your trigger is working. And that day we often will have you meet with one of the doctors to do your pre-operative visit in person. That gives us a chance to check your blood pressure, listen to your heart and lungs and clear you for surgery. And at the visit, you'll also sign consent forms. We typically are gonna go through a lot of instructions on that visit and you're gonna get a repeat of those instructions before you go home from your retrieval the next day. But let me give you my typical spiel. First of all, um, when you're going through um, a retrieval, you're gonna know exactly what day and time to come in. Usually a retrieval will be scheduled in the morning. You'll be instructed to come in 30 minutes before and you're gonna be instructed to come in hungry and thirsty. That means nothing to eat or drink after midnight the night before your procedure, not even sips of water. The only exception to that is if you take blood pressure medication, uh, we do want you to take that before your procedure, but otherwise you should come in hungry and thirsty and we promise not to talk too much about food. When you get to the office, our nurse is going to bring you back to the post-op area to get you checked in and they're going to put a little IV in your vein to get you fluids through that IV, get you rehydrated. You'll then meet with our nurse anesthetist who's gonna go through your medical history and you're gonna fill out a form in that pre-op visit that fills in all their possible medical history. And if you've had reactions to anesthesia in the past, this is where you're gonna write that down for us. Our nurse anesthetist is gonna go through that information and ask any follow-up questions that she may need to, to make sure we get the right doses for you to be comfortable. Um, we use two to three main medications when you go through egg retrieval that allow you to be completely asleep and comfortable during that procedure. And from the post-op area, we're gonna walk you to the procedure room. All of it happens in our main building where you've seen us for your testing thus far. We're gonna walk you to the procedure room and lay you down on an exam room table, give you medications through the IV. You're gonna take the best nap of your damn life and after you're asleep, we're gonna put your feet up into stirrups. So you may not even remember being in that GYN position. The, um, the anesthesia is pretty strong and we do that on purpose to keep you comfortable. But when you wake up, we're gonna make sure you're comfortable. We do not want you to drive yourself home. Somebody else needs to give you a ride home. We don't want you to drive for 24 hours after the anesthesia. By the following day, most women are feeling fine. Honestly, the same day, most women are feeling fine. You're gonna go home that morning. You're gonna be walking around. You're gonna be eating, you're gonna be peeing. You're gonna be pooping. You're gonna kind of feel maybe a little loopy and your head's in the clouds, but you might not notice it. And so for that reason, no driving. I also tell patients no important decision-making that day, no unsupervised online shopping, no unsupervised online gambling. You sit, you relax, you watch some Netflix, if you've got another kid running around the house, you try to avoid running around after them and picking them up, but you'll be on your feet and moving around. We just don't want you to have to do anything too important. When you're asleep and your legs are up in stirrups, we usually use a brown betadine soap to sterilize the skin on the bottom and inside the vagina. And that allows us to help prevent any risk of infection. We're gonna use the same transvaginal ultrasound probe that we've been using to monitor your ovaries throughout the process. But this time the probe has a little needle guide that goes along the top and a long skinny needle that fits through that guide. 
The needle is just going to pop right through the top of the vagina and into your ovaries on each side. And since it's an ultrasound, we can see where our needle is the whole time. We go into each of those follicles and we aspirate the fluid out. And ideally, we're getting little mature eggs out with that fluid. So we're handing the fluid off to the embryologist who's at your bedside throughout the procedure. And they're clearing off the eggs and counting them in real time. That means that you're going to wake up with tiny little puncture holes at the top of the vagina. Usually there's not any stitches, there's not any big incisions, you'll never really know where those puncture holes were. And typically we're taking a look at those puncture sites before you ever wake up from anesthesia to make sure that they're dry and not actively bleeding. When you go home, a little bit of light vaginal bleeding would be very normal, like a light period or lighter. And it should get lighter as the first two to three, four days uh, after retrieval go by. You should know though that most women are gonna get a period anywhere from five to 14 days after the retrieval. So you'll go home and see a little light bleeding, then it goes away, then it picks back up. That's just your period coming, that's very normal. You didn't break anything inside there. But until that period comes, we want you to continue some of the restrictions that we recommend during this process. So that means when you go home, showers are okay, but no bathtubs, no hot tubs, no swimming pools, no submerging above your waist. The last thing I want is like dirty pool water up inside the vagina, infecting those puncture sites where the vagina is trying to heal. Additionally, no tampons and no sex, nothing inside the vagina until your period comes after this retrieval. So if you're having light bleeding, just liners or pads. We also want you to keep the physical activity to a minimum until your period comes. Uh, a lot of people are exercising as part of their kind of fertility journey, trying to live your best life. And we definitely encourage that. But as you're recovering from this process, you're going to have big old ovaries. And when they get smaller, as your period is approaching, they become a little bit shifty and a little bit out of balance. And too much aggressive physical activity, even getting your heart rate up by doing some incline walking can potentially put you at risk for one of those ovaries twisting on itself. And that's something that we call ovarian torsion. Ovarian torsion is a surgical emergency. Your partner's calling us in the middle of the night because you can't stand up straight and you're in excruciating pain and you can't dial the phone yourself. They're taking you to uh, an ER and we're making phone calls to let them know this person just had an egg retrieval. Sounds like a torsion. She might need emergency surgery. And when you have a torsion, you got to go in and you got to untwist that ovary to try to save the tissue and the blood supply gets cut off otherwise. So please be taking it easy until your period comes. And that's how you know your ovaries are pretty well shrunk back down to normal. Um, so that means in general, call for um, heavy bleeding, call for pain that's getting worse and not better. In terms of pain control, we recommend if you're able to take ibuprofen and you can take 600 to 800 milligrams as you're recovering, but we don't want you to take any ibuprofen before the retrieval. It's for only after the retrieval has happened for post-operative pain. If you're having aches or pains before your retrieval, please let us know and we can talk about what things may be helpful and safe at that time. But in the recovery time period, ibuprofen is your friend. You don't need to be a hero. We don't care if you take it or don't take it. So just take it in that way you're comfortable. I would rather you take ibuprofen and be walking around comfortably because you're going to recover faster than not be taking it because you're trying to be a hero, but you're stuck in bed or on a couch because it hurts too much to get up and move. So take it. It's your friend. It's not harmful. Um, if your pain is getting out of control and ibuprofen is not keeping it under control. I want you to notify the office. The other risk is, you know, I mentioned that betadine soap that we use inside the vagina to help sterilize things. When you go home from your retrieval, you'll be given instructions for taking an antibiotic for several days after the retrieval to help make sure that there aren't any bacteria that come from the vagina and decide they want to seed and implant and grow in your ovaries or in your body otherwise. So you'll get instructions and reminder to start taking that with dinner after your retrieval. You don't need to worry about it prior to the procedure. Call if you have a fever, call if you have chills. This is a really low risk procedure for infections. And in fact, you're more likely to get an infection from COVID-19 than you are to get an infection from this procedure. But also call us if you got COVID-19 because we'd like to know that as well for our records, okay? Otherwise, as you're waiting for your period to come, Things are happening in the embryology lab that we've already mentioned. Typically, it takes one week for us to see how many embryos we have frozen on your behalf. And if you opt to do the PGTA testing, it's another two weeks after that that you're awaiting those results. And in the meantime, 
as your period comes, your body is recovering and you're clearing out all of these high hormone levels. So let's switch over now to go through some frequently asked questions. Hopefully some of these have already been answered in what I've gone through, but I asked our IVF coordinators, what are the questions that they get most commonly? And this is what seems to come up. So I like to address them directly. First of all, how many monitoring appointments should I expect? Let me go back to the first couple of slides because this kind of draws out when most of these visits are happening. So when you're doing the stimulation, there's a few more visits and they are a little bit closer in range. In general, from this point to this point of your retrieval is about two weeks. So in those two weeks, you have a visit on your baseline, you have a blood draw a few days later, you have a blood and an ultrasound a few days after that, and then you might have another ultrasound two days later, ultrasound two days later, ultrasound one to two days later. On average, women are ready for trigger around 12 days into their stimulation medications. And then you get your retrieval two days after that, and you're coming in on each of these three days as well. So it ends up being somewhere between you know, five to eight visits just for the stimulation part of the protocol. So what side effects should I expect from the medications? In general, expect to have some bruising on your belly. Some of these medications have a little bit of dirt burning and stinging when you put them in that lasts an hour to two hours and then it typically will go away. I did mention sometimes people are actually allergic to these medications. So if you are having some kind of reaction, you're not sure if it's normal, let your team know so that we could evaluate it. Um, when it comes to what people are really asking, a lot of women wanna know, is this gonna make me a crazy person? And the answer is maybe, <laughs> and to be honest, I have about a third of my patients that take these medications and they feel totally normal. It's like they're not taking anything. They feel some stuff happening on their ovaries, but mentally rock solid, no issues. I have a third of my patients that actually feel better when they're taking these medications. And maybe it's something about, you know, making your own hormones at a higher dose. It, there's a little bit of a, a nice feeling in that. And as a little bit of a personal anecdote, I went through an IVF cycle when I was 33, several years ago. And on the day of my trigger, I was feeling so well. I did an ugly sweater 5K because it was December. And then I got on a bike with some of my co-fellows and we did a 30 mile bike ride. I was feeling really good. I do not want you to do those things when you go through this IVF cycle. Okay, do not do what I did because I ended up not getting as many eggs as I hoped. And I think that some of that was just a ovulated prematurely. So please don't go crazy on the day of your trigger. If you're feeling good, great, but please don't use that as an excuse to go out and do all of your best physical activities all in one day. So some people feel really good. The There's a subset of people who sometimes this is a really hard process and the changes in hormones can be even harder to manage than just the fact that you're in this infertility world at all. When you're taking the medications that we give you that help you to grow and recruit more follicles, it's important to know that the actual high hormone levels that you're seeing are not the medicines we're giving you. It's your own overproduction of estrogen and of progesterone, but those are natural hormones to you. Most women who ovulate regularly make those hormones every month. So we're not giving you um, a replacement for those when you do IVF. We are simply helping you to make higher doses of it. And so for that reason, many women experience IVF hormone changes very differently than being on a birth control, for example. I have a lot of patients that just hate being on birth control pills. They don't like the way they feel on them. This is different. And I want you to feel confidently that just because you might not like being on birth control doesn't mean you're going to be a hot mess when you do this. The people that I do find struggle a little bit more with the side effects in terms of like, I'm a crazy person when I take these things. But the people that are already suffering from a little bit of stress and anxiety from infertility in general. So it may not be the meds that are causing it, but the meds may make things a little bit worse. And when you go through an IVF cycle, it's really important that you set aside space for this to be like kind of your best, most stress-free two weeks, okay? Don't decide you're also going to have a visit from the in-laws during these two weeks. Don't decide you're also going to take a trip to Disney on the weekend in between your first and second weeks. This is a time to rest and relax and create space for the things that you enjoy otherwise so that you're in a good headspace for whatever these hormones might make you feel 
how you deal with them and how you cope with them has a lot to do with your own stress level. So know that there's no guarantee that you're going to be a crazy person just because we're manipulating hormones, okay? Are there exercise or intercourse restrictions during the stimulation cycle? Yes, I already said, don't go out and run an ugly sweater 5K in the snow and then get on your bicycle for 30 miles. Please be taking it easy. In the first week or so, your ovaries are usually not that enlarged. It's not dangerous to be doing some exercise. But if you're getting your heart rate up a lot and your metabolism is up a lot, you might be burning through this medication a little bit faster and you might need higher doses. So you want to keep things light, keep them easy, keep them low stress. In the second week of stimulation, we don't want you to do anything that could be too crazy in terms of jostling, because again, we've got that risk for ovarian torsion with your enlarged ovaries. Same is true for intercourse. Once you get started with stimulations, we typically say nothing in the vagina and especially not intercourse, in part because that's a really great way to twist an ovary and now you're traumatized about sex in general. But also when we do the egg retrieval, we try to get out every single egg we can safely get to, but there could always be a straggler, a late ovulator. And while the whole goal of this is fertility, the whole goal is not let me get pregnant by accident with six eggs that I ovulated late because I had sex three days after my retrieval. Nothing in the vagina until you get your period after this retrieval is done. Do we recommend ICSI or ICSI? So ICSI is the process called intras, uh, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And what that means is when you've got your egg and you've got your sperm, there's sort of two main ways in the IVF world where we can fertilize your eggs. One way is you take your egg and then you take somewhere between 50 to 100,000 sperm and you drop them in the well with the egg. And then you let the sperm kind of figure it out. And then you lift the lid off the box the next morning and you make sure that the magic happened. With ICSI, you take those sperm and you lay them all out in front of you and you find the ones that look normal and you find the ones that are swimming forward and you hand select those sperm and our embryo, not you, but our embryologists, you won't be in the lab. We're going to do this for you. It takes decades of training to pick the right sperm. So we're going to leave that to our experts, but they're going to pick the sperm. They're going to suck those little sperm up with a tiny little needle and they inject it into the tiny little egg and they drop the sperm off inside the um, egg. And that way, just in case that sperm doesn't figure out how to fertilize the egg, and maybe that's part of the fertility problem that you have had all along, that sperm just needs to show up and we're gonna put it where it needs to go. When you do ICSI, it eliminates the rare but real possibility of failed fertilization. So every once in a while, a couple will come through where we incubate those eggs with a 50 to 10, 50 to 100,000 sperm or so, and you wake up the next day and all the sperm are dead and the eggs are not fertilized. And there's some miscommunication between those sperm and egg. And if that happens, now you just spent the last two weeks taking medications and we're probably gonna have to do this again. So because that rare but potential thing does happen, in our lab, we've kind of switched over to routinely doing ICSI for pretty much everybody. Um, there are some situations where we don't. We do what we call conventional insemination, just incubating the eggs and sperm together. And the, this is one of the things in the field that swings like a pendulum. Sometimes we're on the side of the pendulum where we do ICSI for everybody. Sometimes the pendulum swims back where maybe now we only do ICSI if there is some abnormality on the semen analysis. In general, chances are your doctor is going to recommend ICSI at this time, but I say that it could change over time. All of this is very well studied, and science gives us more information every day that updates the way that we practice. So if there's a good study that comes out that suggests maybe we shouldn't be using ICSI for everybody, maybe the case that your doctor actually says something contrary to what we've just discussed today on this video. How many embryo updates will I get and who's going to update me? So you're going to know when you leave after your retrieval, how many eggs you got out, but it's going to be a preliminary count because the embryologist can only count how many there are. They won't know yet how many are mature. The next morning, you're going to get an update email from the embryology lab that lets you know how many total eggs there were, how many were mature, and as of the next morning, if you're fertilizing them, how many of them took up the sperm normally and are going to continue to be incubated. 
Then a week later, you'll get your second update from the embryology lab directly, usually in an email that tells you how many of those fertilized eggs are good quality embryos that were frozen or biopsied and frozen on your behalf. And in that second email, usually you'll be instructed to call your team or call the front desk to schedule your follow-up post IVF Zoom consult with your doctor. So typically it's two email updates that come from the lab directly. Every once in a while, we'll have couples or patients that go through this cycle that don't end up with any good quality blastocyst embryos at the other end of the process. And then that scenario, usually your doctor is going to be notified and they're going to reach out to you directly to let you know. And typically they're going to encourage you to have a Zoom consult at a later point in time where they can go through some of the embryology findings with you and lay out a new plan. So more general questions. What is our success rate? Um, that's going to depend wildly on your age, on your egg quantity and your egg reserve, on the quality of the sperm. It could range anywhere from, you know, if you're under 35, you have a great egg uh, reserve and great egg quality and normal sperm. Maybe you're just doing this because your fallopian tubes are blocked. In that situation, and you're testing your embryos, your success rate might be 60 to 75% chance of going home or, or going on to have an ongoing pregnancy and being discharged from our office with a pregnancy. In situations where women are older, that success rate obviously goes down so that when you're, you know, approaching 40 or in your 40s, that success rate might be closer between like 40 to 60%. Um, once you get older, older, which unfortunately is about above the age of 43, that's where our success rates really do start to go down. And you want to make sure that you've got adequate egg quantity to make up for egg quality. And these are really intimate conversations that are going to be personalized between you and your doctor so that you go into your IVF cycle, having a good idea of what your own prognosis is. It's typically the case that if your prognosis is very low, and doing an IVF cycle is futile. We'll never say that we won't do it, but we wanna make sure that you know what the other options are. And the main other option, if going through this is not actually gonna work for you at a very high rate, is the thing about considering an egg donor or considering a sperm donor. We'll never tell a patient that that's the only option that they have, they have to do that. But going into this, knowing what your own success rate is, is part of why we do all of our diagnostic testing because it's a wide range and it depends a little bit on you and your results. Who's going to perform my egg retrieval, my embryo transfer? The egg retrieval is a little bit based on like a doc of the day system. So all three of us doctors, myself and Dr. Beattie and Dr. Shapiro, rotate days that we manage our retrievals. And so uh, right now, if you're landing at the beginning of the week, your retrieval may be with Dr. Beattie or Dr. Shapiro. At the end of the week, your retrieval may be with me. If it's over a weekend, we split the weekend. So it depends on who's on call that weekend. So you may not know until the time of your trigger who's actually going to be the provider doing your retrieval. As a woman, I would trust either of my colleagues to do an egg retrieval for me. Um, I hope they would say the same about me. I guess I never really asked Dr. Shapiro who he thinks would do his egg retrieval if he had ovaries. But that's kind of our general practices. We all work closely together and we've stuck with this practice for a while because we trust each other immensely. So if it's not your own personal doctor doing the retrieval, that doesn't mean that you're gonna be in lesser hands. When it comes to the transfer, we try our hardest to get our own patients on our schedules for our transfer days. So each of us have days of the week when we're not in office and we're working from home, especially since COVID. The goal is that if you're my patient, we try not to have your transfer scheduled on a day that I work from home. If it needed to happen that way, because we're working with human bodies and sometimes they do what they need to do, we'll wiggle a little bit and we'll make sure that you're comfortable with the plan for one of our partners covering for us. Or if one of us has a vacation week coming up and you'd rather keep going with what your body's doing as opposed to, you know, put yourself in pause and wait until Dr. K is back from vacation to have the transfer. Uh, we can do it those ways where we will definitely share the responsibilities with each other. But we do like to do the transfers ourselves because you're awake for that. Typically, your partner comes in for that as well. And it's a really important, really special procedure for us. What would cause a cycle or a transfer to get canceled? So it's a really good question. I tried to answer some of that along the way. When it comes to the stimulation, your cycle could be canceled if you ovulate too early. Maybe these early suppression medications don't get started early enough. Or maybe they're just not strong enough. It occasionally happens that 
the brain will break through and tell you to start ovulating and then we've lost the chance to retrieve those eggs and we have to start over. Another possibility is maybe we're using medications and your eggs are just not responding. That doesn't mean that's going to happen every single time, but you may have to stop and restart or modify your treatment cycle a little bit to get the best possible outcome. And in an ideal world, a lot of the time we try to do this once and do it as best as possible. There may be situations where you go into it knowing that you're going to have to do more than one stimulation and egg retrieval cycle. And those are situations where your egg supply might be low, where we know that we're looking for something very specific on our genetic testing and we need to make more embryos to have more available. For a transfer cycle, when is that potentially canceled? Again, if there's any sign that your uterus is doing something we don't want it to do, it's growing too fast, too thick, too quickly, or it's staying thin for too long, or there's an irregularity, or it gets filled up with fluid or mucus, anything like that where we think that this embryo might be wasted when we put it inside, we stop and we restart. In both of these cases, we sometimes will have you come in for a baseline and we all get really excited to get started on our medications. And on baseline, you have a cyst or a follicle or an elevated uh, estrogen level or a lining that looks like it's not quite ready to get started. Sometimes you come in at your baseline with the hopes of getting started and we say, unfortunately, the timing doesn't look perfect. And when that's the case, we let you know what we want you to do to get you to that perfect starting time. But all of this, again, is working with human bodies and rolling with the punches that your body decides that it wants to give us. How long can frozen embryos be stored at the clinic? probably at least 30 years. That's sort of the longest that an embryo has been used in you know, a very young child who had to have an embryo extracted and created because she was going through treatment for childhood cancer. And then that person later became pregnant 30 years later, the embryo was still good. I don't recommend that you wait 30 years to use your embryos. Please use them before that. But uh, as far as we know, that's how long they're good. Once they are frozen, they don't really have... Um, a time stamp anymore. They really are stuck in time. And that's, that's the, the beauty of freezing these embryos. How long would you keep them stored here is another question and more of a logistics one. We have like quarterly storage fees that are lab charges. And if eventually you get to the point where you are done building your family and you have extra embryos that you don't wish to hold on to, there are a number of options for what do we do with these embryos. One option is you simply discard them. The way we see this, this is just tissue in a dish that's been frozen for you like anything else. It doesn't have the potential to be a pregnancy unless you intend to put it into a uterus where a pregnancy can occur. And so otherwise, we just discard it. Another option is you can allow our lab to use it for things like quality control and training and education purposes. Um, all of the time we are doing checks and balances and making sure that our embryologists are up to speed and that they're practicing techniques. And oftentimes we'll use this on, or we'll do these things on embryos that are discarded because we're otherwise done with them for clinical purposes. And that is a great help to us to make sure that our lab stays up to date, state of the art, well-trained. So you can donate embryos for that purpose. You also can donate extra unused embryos to another family. This is something that we call embryo donation and embryo adoption. A lot of people approach this like if they're blessed to have extra embryos, they want to pay it forward to another couple that might not have that same good luck. And we do it all anonymously. But if you're interested in donating your extra embryos to speak with your coordinator about what that process looks like. And essentially we hold on to them uh, frozen until you know you're definitively done with them. And then we put anonymous profiles up for other people to look at and accept embryos in a donation scenario. Are there other things that I should be doing? This is a great question. And it comes to like, what are the things besides medications and monitoring and following all the instructions that you guys think I'm doing that maybe I'm not because I don't read everything. I know that you do read everything. And so I know that's really where this question comes from. Are there supplements? Are there fruits? Are there different things that we are, that, that work? Um, and in general, there are no magic bullets. Let me say that. If you feel like you're doing the medications and following the schedule that we give you, that is all you need to be doing. But in general, for those patients that feel like they need to go above and beyond, we wanna make sure you're taking a prenatal vitamin, get that started before you start your treatment cycle. A lot of people need to be on extra vitamin D. And so if that was low when you went through your diagnostic testing, make sure you're on enough vitamin D. Be living your best life in general, and that means dietary modifications and exercise regimens that you feel like 
you know you need to do because the pandemic was hard and you put on an extra 15 to 20 pounds or cutting out things like alcohol and tobacco that you know you need to do but stress management is a real thing and sometimes that's the only thing that makes you feel okay with the end of your day all of those things that we lean on and that we know we should be doing this is the time and this is the reason to start doing those things and to get really disciplined all of it for me though in, in general is about minimizing stress so if you're not a person that wants to be on 16 extra supplements don't get on 16 extra supplements you probably don't need them if you are a person that feels better having 16 extra supplements go read it starts with the egg i think it's a, a an excellent read for people who want to know more about that but if in reading that you're getting super stressed out stop because it's not strictly necessary most of the things that are extra that you're reading about that you're googling they don't have a lot of great evidence or your doctor would already be telling you to do them up front and so if you want to be doing more, you can. There are supplements that are okay, but always check with your team before you get started on them because there are also supplements and hormones that are supposed to be pro-fertility or hormone modifying or hormone mediating. And those things actually can interfere with the medications that we use in this process. So prior to starting anything, check, but know that these medications in most cases should be all that you need in addition to good sleep, well-balanced diet, living your best life in terms of physical activity, avoiding tobacco, avoiding alcohol during this process. As long as you are doing those things, you're doing what you need to be doing and don't add any additional stress thinking there's something that you're missing. So in general, let me introduce you to the team real quick before we conclude. Um, this is me, <laughs> if you couldn't tell from the video, I don't look quite so nicely made up today as I did for this picture and probably never will again, uh, but it is what it is. You get what you see, okay? This is Dr. Beattie, and who's another one of our partners, and then Dr. Shapiro, who's our, our founding practice member. And so all three of us could potentially be doing your retrievals and or your transfers at any given time. Also, here's Christy and Katie. They're our IVF coordinators, or at least two of the IVF coordinators that are working with most of our patients are doing our own IVF. If you're in a scenario where you're viewing this video, but somebody else is going through the IVF process for you, like an egg donor, uh, then your coordinators might be a different team. We call them our third-party reproduction coordinators. It's also important to recognize Julie and Jennifer, who are financial coordinators that help a lot with getting patients through this process when it comes to the financial quote that you get up front. As you're reviewing this video, you may be waiting for your quote to come from you. Chances are it's going to be coming from Julie. If there are questions, you direct them back to her or to Jennifer. And some of the more complicated scenarios, some of that's going to go through Jennifer as well. So I show you who the both of them are. So let me stop sharing my screen at this point. And otherwise, uh, that's kind of the conclusion of this video and the information. Do keep an eye out for additional information when it comes to medication administration instructions, because our goal is to do another shortened video simply on a lot of these injections, how to mix them, how to drop your doses and make sure you're giving them so accurately. But otherwise, if there are questions or variations on this sort of basic protocol that you have, direct them to your team, direct them to your doctor, and we're happy to answer any questions. Best of luck on your cycle.